Chapter 2. Mr. Cheeseman and his three smart, witty, attractive, polite, and relatively odor-free children were packed up and ready to move away once again to their new home, which they all hoped would have a sound roof and a pleasant-smelling driveway. Okay, this is it, said Mr. Cheeseman. He flipped off the lights in the boys' room, and when he did, did he saw something through the window that caused his eyes to narrow. What is it, Dad? asked Barton. What's wrong? They're here, Mr. Cheeseman said, his gaze fixed on a gray sedan parked out front beneath the dull glow of a streetlight. They're already here. Grrr, said Pinky. What do we do now? asked Saffron. In the two years they'd been on the run, this was the first time they hadn't gotten away before the coats arrived. I can't promise it'll work, uh, said Mr. Cheeseman, nervously biting his lower lip, but I've got an idea. Mr. Cheeseman led the children through the darkened house and into the garage, where the rusted gray, I'm sorry, where the rusted white station wagon was loaded to the ceiling with all that it could hold in the way of toys, clothing, dirt clods shaped like celebrities, and the LVR disassembled into several large pieces and covered with a blue tarp. As always, the car had been backed into the garage, its nose facing the door to help hasten a last-minute escape. Even if we get past them, said Barton, won't they just follow us? I think they'll try, said Mr. Cheeseman. But if all goes according to plan, they won't get very far. Why not, asked Barton. A little invention I like to call the inertia ray. Mr. Cheeseman helped a very sleepy Crandall into the back seat. What's an inertia ray? wondered Saffron. I came up with the idea while working on the LVR, which operates on the principle that the speed of light can be manipulated to alter the speed of objects in its path, Mr. Cheeseman explained. Scientifically speaking, people who are struck by a beam of light traveling at several times the speed of light will be temporarily rendered motionless. But how can light travel faster than the speed of light? asked Barton. That's impossible. Not necessarily, said Saffron, not about to miss an opportunity to show off her oversized brain. Light can be made to travel faster than the speed of light, the same way that a tortoise can be made to travel faster than the speed of tortoise, by boarding a fast-moving train or an airplane. Exactly, said Mr. Cheeseman. The inertia ray is too light as the jet airplane is to the tortoise. I understand that, said Saffron, but how will it help us now? Well, that's obvious, said Barton. Uh, tell her, Dad. It is simple, really. Last night, I hooked up the inertia ray to the high beams on the station wagon. Let's hope I did it correctly, because right now it's our only hope of getting out of here. With that, Mr. Cheeseman fired up the engine... He took a deep breath and narrowed his eyes, then clicked the automatic garage door opener. Slowly, the door peeled away to reveal the gray car parked directly across the street. Keep your fingers crossed, said Mr. Cheeseman. Here we go. He hit the gas and the station wagon bolted from the garage. As the car neared the end of the driveway, Mr. Cheeseman hit the high beams, aiming them directly at the gray car. As Mr. Cheeseman turned left and drove past the car, the children looked out to see a man dressed in a gray suit behind the wheel, completely frozen in time, like a wax figure holding a cell phone, his mouth open in mid-sentence. In the passenger seat was another man dressed in gray, taking a bite of a sandwich, and he was likewise frozen in time. It worked, said Barton. It sure did, said Mr. Cheeseman, perfectly pleased with himself. It's only a temporary effect, but it should give us a good ten minutes or so before they snap out of it. Just then, with the squealing of tires, a little brown car turned from the side street and moved in directly behind them. Dad, said Barton. I see them, said Mr. Cheeseman. What do we do, asked Saffron. What do we do, Mr. Cheeseman repeated. We hold on. With that, Mr. Cheeseman hit the gas, temporarily pulling away from the brown car. But the station wagon was a slow-moving car to begin with. Load it down with four people, a disassembled, non-working time machine, several boxes of toys, books, clothing, and dirt clods, you're lucky to outrun a three-wheeled shopping cart. Within seconds, the little brown car regained its ground and pulled up directly behind them. 
Prepare for evasive maneuvers, Mr. Cheeseman shouted to the children over his shoulder. Their heads snapped to the left as Mr. Cheeseman cranked the wheel hard to the right, causing the tires to chirp loudly as the station wagon flew down a side street. The brown car made the same turn, but much more cautiously, thus giving the station wagon a good 50-foot head start. Okay, everybody, Mr. Che Cheeseman warned. Hold on tight, because here we go. As the brown car began to close the gap, Mr. Cheeseman stomped on the brake pedal while cranking the wheel to the left as far as it would go, causing the station wagon to fly into a violent spin, at one point rolling up onto two wheels. When it finally came to rest on all of its wheels, the station wagon was facing in the opposite direction, with the brown car speeding directly toward it. Dad, look out! Barton shouted as he cowered behind the dashboard. The driver of the brown car hit the brakes, but it slowed only slightly as it skidded toward a head-on collision with the station wagon. Barton dug his fingernails into the dashboard. Saffron hid her face in her hands. Crandall and Steve hugged each other tightly, preparing for the worst. With less than two seconds to impact, Mr. Cheeseman reached up and hit the high beam switch, sending a stream of light traveling at several times the speed of light directly at the brown car. Instantly, the car froze. Mr. Cheeseman threw the station wagon into reverse and backed up a few feet before pulling it in, putting it in drive and screaming off down the street, leaving their pursuers in suspended animation. Saffron uncovered her eyes. Crandall and Steve did not stop hugging each other. Barton pulled his fingernails from the dashboard. Though he hit it well, Barton was secretly embarrassed by how he had reacted so cowardly in the face of danger. Silently, he vowed that the next time he found himself in similar circumstances, he would respond bravely like his father, like a true man of action. That was close, he gasped, feeling as though he might pass out. It sure was, said Mr. Cheeseman. I must remember for future reference to install the inertia ray on the taillights as well. Dad, Randall asked, is everything going to be okay? I hope so, said Mr. Cheeseman, but only time will tell. Yes, what you got? What is the inertia ray. I N E R T I A. Inertia ray. That was what he used with the headlights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we got to know a little bit about how they reacted to danger. So that kind of teaches us a little bit about their characteristics. Um, and then we'll have to see if they change throughout the book or if that's just kind of who they are. You also, if you're starting slides for characters, we also kind of had a hint that one of the groups of people chasing them was in a gray car, and I think it said they had a gray suits on, and then the other little brown car was chasing them after that. So if you want to start a page for the gray group and the brown group, I think we're going to get to know more about them soon. Can we just call it a gray car? Uh, yeah, you can probably change the title later, but whatever you want to call it for now, just to kind of make room for it. And then the like the little brown car, yeah. We'll we'll add names to it as we learn them. Some timely advice on time travel. If there's one thing we can all agree on, it's what time it is. We humans have been fighting for centuries over things like which god and or gods to worship, or who owns which chunk of land, or who shot a fellow named Archduke Ferdinand. Never once, however, has there been a major war or serious skirmish over the correct time. We all seem to agree that an hour is made up of 60 minutes, a minute is composed of 60 seconds, and a second is equal to one Mississippi. The fact that we agree on this is significant because it means that all those wars about all the other things began on schedule. What would happen if we could suddenly change the time? I'm not talking about daylight savings or people who intentionally set their watches five minutes fast so they never will be late, and then they're required to do math when you ask them what time it is. Excuse me, do you have the time? People say to them. Well, let's see. My watch says 3.03, so I have to borrow from the zero. Uh, yeah, it's 2.98. What I'm talking about here is much bigger than resetting your watch. I'm talking about changing the very time that encircles you, altering the time in which you exist. What if a device could transport us to any time in history, or prehistory for that matter? How could we change the past to improve the present and secure the future for all humankind? 
For years, scientists have hypothesized that one day time travel will be a reality, though never with more than two carry-on bags. The question remains, however, as to whether this is a good thing. What effect will changing the past have on the present and the future? I would advise anyone traveling across the time-space continuum to respect the past, because without it, the present might very well cease to exist. A wise man once said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And that would be a terrible thing, because as a wise man once said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. As we just did there. <laughs> Chapter 3. Mr. Cheeseman had been driving for three hours when finally night began to move aside and the new day inched slowly above the distant hills. I'm going to pause just one second here. The new day inched across the hills. What is that? What lit term is that? Do you remember? The, the new day is acting in a certain way. Oh, persona. That sounds like personification to me. Yeah, good job. Okay, gang, said Mr. Cheeseman, checking the rearview mirror and he was happy to find it remained completely free of pursuers. Looks like we made it. Pinky hasn't growled in over an hour, so at least for the time being, it appears as though we're out of danger. Can we do the names now? Crandall said with a yawn. The only fun part about being on the run from various pursuers, all falling over themselves to get their hands on the LVR, was that each time Mr. Cheeseman and his family moved, he required the children to completely change their identities. This was done for their own safety, and the best part was that they were each allowed to choose their own names, both first and last, with absolutely no interference from their father, who felt that a child's creativity should never be harnessed. Sure, said Mr. Cheeseman, if you're ready. I'm ready, said Crandall. Uh, I'm going to pause again just one second. So on the slide where you have the characters, um, on each slide for each character, you're going to go in, and I would just add the new name. I would not delete the old one. So they're actually going to change their names for the next part of the book. So wherever it says Crandall, you're going to go there, maybe put a slash, and then add his new name when he tells us. Do that for each of the children. All right, back to the book. I'm ready, said Crandall. I've already got my new name all picked out. From now on, you can call me... Crandall paused for dramatic effect, as he always did, chewing on his giant wad of flavorless bubble gum. Gerard Lafontaine. How do you spell that? Hold on. Mr. Cheeseman rubbed his chin and nodded his head, slowly, also for dramatic effect. I like it, he said. Good work, Gerard. Thanks, said Gerard, who had in the past had gone by such names as Ernesto Diablo, Johnny Cigar, Carlton J. Moneypants, and most recently, Crandall Moriarty. All right, so if you have Crandall, we're going to add Gerard. G-E-R-A-R-D. Hmm, I don't know. You don't really look like a Gerard said Saffron, who in the past had given her names such as Lucretia D., Paprika Jones, Salmonella Sneezeguard, and most recently, Saffron Ponderosa. I kind of like it, said Barton. It sounds sophisticated. That's what I mean, said Saffron with a flip of her auburn hair. Doesn't really suit him at all. I am so sophisticated said the newly named Gerard. Anyway, it's probably better than your new name, Saffron. I will thank you, replied Saffron, to address me by my proper name, which from this point forward will be Magenta Jean Jurgensen. Gerard's first inclination was to make fun of his sister's new name, but he had to admit that Magenta Jean Jurgensen had a pretty good ring to it, and so he decided to simply keep his mouth shut. Steve the Sock Puppet, on the other hand, the left hand, to be precise, showed no restraint and blurted out, That's the dumbest name I've ever heard! Saffron, or should I say, Magenta Jean, reached out and flicked Steve the Sock Puppet with her middle finger. Zoinks! Mm -hmm. Well, I like it very much, said Mr. Cheeseman. 
It is a bit of a mouthful, however. You can call me Maggie for short, said Magenta Jean. Unless you're angry with me. And then you can say, Magenta Jean Jurgensen, you get in here this instant. Come now, said Mr. Cheeseman. When is the last time I got angry with you? October 16th of last year, said Maggie, who had nothing short of an incredible memory. About 4.40 in the afternoon. Well, I don't remember that at all, said Mr. Cheeseman. Why was I angry with you? If you don't remember, I don't think I want to remind you. Point made, Maggie. Okay, Barton, you're next. Have you decided on a new name for yourself? Yup, said Barton, who had previously answered to such names as Figaro Lowenstein, Antoine Razorback, Lucius Aloysius von Dignatius III, and most recently, recently, Barton Burden. My new name will be Joe Smith. Maggie and Gerard immediately broke into laughter, assuming their older brother must be joking. When he himself failed to even crack a smile, they knew he must be serious. Joe Smith, said Gerard. That's not very sophisticated. I hate to say it, said Maggie, twirling a strand of reddish hair around her index finger. But I kind of agree with Gerard. Joe Smith seems kind of boring. But Dad, I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Cheeseman said, it is slightly less imaginative than we've come to expect from you. But Dad, you're jumping to conclusions before having all the evidence. Something you've told us not to do. Sure, the name Joe Smith might be kind of boring, unless it looks like this. He handed his father a piece of paper upon which he had written the name Joe Smith. And for those of you at home, Joe is spelled J-O-U-G-H and Smith is P-S-M-Y-T-H-E. Mr. Cheeseman took his eyes off the road and rearview mirror long enough to glance at the piece of paper. He said nothing and simply broke into a smile that indicated, that's more like it. What is it? clamored Gerard. What does it say? Mr. Cheeseman handed the piece of paper back over his shoulder, and as Gerard reached for it, Maggie snatched it away. Um, no, I don't think Pinky's changing her name. Uh, Maggie was Saffron. Saffron is now Maggie. And Barton is now Joe. Smith. Um, Joe Smith, she said, wadding up the paper in disgust. What, you don't like it? Asked Joe, who could be very sensitive about these things. That's not it at all, said Maggie. In fact, I have to admit it's perfect. I just wish I had come up with it first. That's ridiculous, said Steve the Sock Puppet. Joe is a boy's name. Back near the pale yellow house that Mr. Cheeseman and his children had most recently called home, the occupants of the gray car and the little brown car had shaken off the effects of the inertia ray and had returned to normal, only to find that the white station wagon had vanished. Meanwhile, a third car, a long black station wagon with equally black windows, pulled slowly into the driveway of the yellow house, just as the gray car was driving away. The doors opened and four men in dark suits and dark sunglasses hopped out of the car. Truth be told, this is only an expression. They did not actually hop out of the car, as this would not only increase one's chances of hitting one's head on the way out, but it would also look very silly. And trust me when I say that these men were not in the habit of doing anything to make themselves look silly. As the serious looking men stood before the pale yellow house, none of them gave even the slightest thought to the lovely smell of the freshly wet pavement of the driveway. Instead, three of the men looked to the fourth as if awaiting instructions. The man they looked to was known only as Mr. Five. And they actually write that with the digit five, not, not spelling it out. Mr. and then the number five. The other three were known as Mr. 29, Mr. 88, and Mr. 207. This should give you an idea of just how important Mr. 5 was in the grand scheme of things. 
Okay, so I'm gonna pause for just a quick sec. If you created a slide for the gray car and for the little brown car, now we've got the long black car and all the people that are getting out of it have numbers instead of names. So we've got, let's switch to black here. We've got Mr. Five, we've got Mr. 29, we've got Mr. 88. You can keep all these together on one page if you want. Uh, and we've got Mr. 207. If you want them to each have their own slide, that's great. If not, you can just keep them as that group together. Tall and slim, Mr. Five had an exceedingly bony face and cheeks so hollow, it looked as if they were sewn together from the inside. His bald, sweaty head and his large reflective sunglasses gave him the look of a shiny, pale insect. Without speaking, he nodded toward Mr. 88 and Mr. 207. The two men nodded back, apparently in complete agreement with whatever it is Mr. Five had not said. The two men then walked around the side of the house toward the backyard, leaving Mr. Five and Mr. 29, uh, I'm sorry, leaving Mr. Five and Mr. 29, a fellow of enormous size, with giant rings on each finger of his right hand, standing in the driveway. Mr. Five walked up the steps of the front porch and followed, Mr. 29 followed dutifully. When they reached the front door, Mr. Five looked at his oversized compatriot and nodded as if they were about to do something they had done thousands of times before. Mr. 29 responded to the nod by removing a small but powerful set of bolt cutters from his pocket. He applied the bolt cutters to the door handle and with one quick snap of his enormous hands, clipped off the entire doorknob causing it to fall to the ground, bounce down the front stairs, roll into a flower bed, and nearly crushed a ladybug named Doris. Again, Mr. Five nodded toward Mr. 29, who simply responded by kicking in the front door of the house. He kicked with such force that the door actually said goodbye to its hinges and fell onto the living room floor. They're gone, said Mr. 29. I can see that, you idiot hissed Mr. Five as he grabbed the large man's necktie and pulled him close to his unnaturally bony face. The question is, why are they gone? Mr. Five released Mr. 29's necktie and wiped a bead of cold sweat from his clammy forehead. As he did, the sleeve on his left arm receded just far enough to reveal a series of letters and numbers tattooed on his wrist in dark black ink. The oddly cryptic tattoo read, 3-V-A-W-1-X-3-1-9. Just then, Mr. 88 and Mr. 207 burst in through the back door. Looks like they're gone, said Mr. 207. Brilliant deduction, said Mr. 5. Did your mother drop you on your head? And what's that in your hand? It's a plum, said Mr. 207, biting into the bright purple fruit. There's a tree out back. Very nice flavor. Get rid of it. This is not snack time. Mr. 207 sheepishly tossed the partially eaten plum to the floor. We're here for one reason, and one reason only, said Mr. Five, pacing around the room. Do you understand me? The three men all nodded agreeably. This is the seventh time. The seventh time that we've responded to information as to their whereabouts, and the seventh time we've arrived too late. Somebody must be tipping them off. Mr. Five looked suspiciously at the three men standing before him. Well, certainly you don't think it's one of us, said Mr. 88. It's possible, isn't it? Said Mr. Five, as he squatted down to inspect a doggy chew toy left behind in the panic. Who do you think is tipping them off? The family dog? No, sir, said Mr. 88 with an incredulous chuckle. Of course not. But when I find out who is responsible, that person will wish he had never been born. That, I promise you. Mr. Five reached into his breast pocket and pulled out a very small cell phone, about the size of a matchbook. He put the phone to his mouth and spoke a single word. Headquarters. He waited for a moment, then a woman's voice came through the earpiece. Headquarters, go ahead, Mr. Five. Yes, I need to speak to Mr. One immediately. I'm sorry, but Mr. One is unavailable at the moment. May I take a message? No, you may not, Mr. Five scowled. 
Let me speak to Mr. Two. Mr. Two is in a meeting, but I'd be happy to. Very well, said Mr. Five, quickly losing his patience. Let me speak to... I'm afraid Mr. Three is also unavailable. Would you like to put me to put you through to Ms. Four? Just the mention of Ms. Four's name made Mr. Five's face look as though it hurt very badly. Fine. I will speak to Ms. Four. One moment, please, said the voice on the other end. Mr. Five covered the mouthpiece of the tiny phone with his thumb, then spun around to face the others. We have failed for the last time, gentlemen. Next time, we will find them, and we will crush them. This bit of information seemed to pique Mr. 88's interest. How? he asked. How what? said Mr. Five, his thumb still pressed over the mouthpiece. How will we crush them? Will we use one of those giant machines at the junkyard that they use to crush old cars? I bet that crushed them real good. Oh, or how about a steamroller? Mr. 207 offered. That'd crush them real good, too. A steamroller? scoffed Mr. 88. That's for squishing, not crushing. Well, aren't they the same thing? Asked Mr. 207, squishing and crushing. <laughs> Hardly, said Mr. 88. Take a tube of toothpaste, for instance. You don't crush it, you squish it from the bottom. I usually squeeze mine from the middle, said the normally quiet Mr. 29. My wife hates that. Would you shut up, all of you? Barked Mr. Five. How do, what does ha toothpaste have to do with anything? Nothing, admitted Mr. 88. I was only trying to figure out what might be the best method of crushing Mr. Cheeseman and his family. <sighs> it was only a figure of speech, you idiot, said Mr. Five. Oh, said Mr. 88, with a sudden look of disappointment. So then, no actual crushing? No, I meant that when we find them, we'll destroy them, ruin them, devastate them to the point that they wish they had never dared to defy us in the first place. I see, said Mr. 88, as he considered this for a moment. Well, how about squishing? On a small tropical island somewhere in the southern hemisphere, there stood a large factory nearly hidden from view by the dense jungle foliage. On a hill above the factory was a large office building, and in that building was an office belonging to a small, thin-lipped woman with long red fingernails named Ms. Four. This is not to say that her long fingernails were named Ms. Four, but the woman herself was named that. As of this writing, the woman had not yet named her fingernails. The phone on her desk emitted a low beep, followed by the sound of a young man's voice saying, Ms. Four, Mr. Six is on line five. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, correction. Mr. Five is on line six. The thin-lipped woman with the nameless red fingernails rearranged her face to look slightly annoyed. Then she reached out and picked up the phone on her desk. Hello, Mr. Five. What is your current status? Have you secured the LVR? Someone must have tipped them off. We lost them. Again, said Mr. Five, swallowing his pride. I would advise you Mr. Five, not to fail again, said Ms. Four, looking out her window at the bustling factory below, if you wish to keep your current position with this company. I believe I've already demonstrated that I will do whatever it takes to get the LVR, and I will get it, or I will die trying, said Mr. Five, wiping his cold, moist, bony forehead with his tattooed left wrist. Yes, yes, you will, said Ms. Four through her thin lips. Did she just threaten him? I think she just threatened his life. He said, I'll find him or I'll die trying. And she said, yeah. Yikes. She seems nice. So does Mr. Five. He, it seems like the smaller the number, the kind of the more intense they get. Yeah, I'm sure that's got to be their ranking, right? It's probably why he was so annoyed that Ms. Four was Ms. Four and he was Mr. Five because she's beating him. Hmm. One more little section here, and then we'll stop for the day. Some much-needed advice on tattoos. There was a time when, if you encountered someone with a tattoo, you could pretty much assume he was either a sailor or he had spent some time in prison. There was something, it seemed, about men being cooped up together that made them want to draw on themselves. But lately, it's become more and more difficult to distinguish sailors and ex-convicts from regular folks. 
as everyone these days is getting a tattoo. People who get tattoos are likely to say it's a great way to express their individuality. But before you decide to express your individuality by doing what everyone else is doing, be forewarned, tattoos are permanent. What then if you happen to choose a tattoo that seems like a good idea at the time, but one day outlives its usefulness? For instance, I'm acquainted with a young woman named Lois, who was so enamored with her fiancé Jack that she thought it might be a nice surprise for him to have the words, I love Jack, tattooed in bright red ink on her right shoulder blade. Two days later, Jack surprised Lois by burying someone else. And so, because tattoos are permanent, she was forced to return to the tattoo parlor and have the words, I love Jack, altered to read, I love flapjacks. That was some time ago. Since then, Lois has gotten over Jack, and she's currently back on the dating scene, and all of her dates seem to take her to the local pancake house. <laughs> this goes to show you that the only place you should ever have your name written in indelible ink is on the waistband of your underwear. And then it should only be your own name, as having someone else's name on your underwear would be both odd and highly inappropriate. The point is, tattoos are permanent, underwear is not. Still, it seems that these days, tattoos are outselling underwear two to one. As popular as they might be, I would advise against getting one at all costs. Because, as with my pancake-loving friend Lois, or with our sweaty, hollow-cheeked non-friend Mr. Five, there will come a day when you will most assuredly regret having it. This I absolutely guarantee, or my name isn't... Wait, this isn't my underwear. Oh, you silly book. So, speaking of lit terms, there will most assuredly come a day when you will regret having this tattoo. What is that called when they tell us something like that in a book? It's kind of like they're warning us about something later. Yeah, we, we know that something, that this tattoo is going to end up giving away more information than he wants to. Yeah, that's called foreshadowing. It's like before you see the actual thing, you see a shadow of it. You see a hint of what it's going to be. And there was also a little bit of foreshadowing in the first chapter, but I didn't want to spoil the book for you yet. We'll go back and look at it later. All right, we're going to stop there.